Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 35th meeting of 2018. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I remind everyone to switch mobile phones off as they may affect the broadcasting system. We also have a change to the agenda as originally published. We will suspend the meeting after agenda, agenda item 5 and will reconvene at 2.30pm to hear evidence from the Scottish Government officials in relation to a consent notification sent to us by the Scottish Government under the terms of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. I'd also like to mention that um, Richard Lyle and Rhoda Grant have resigned their membership of the committee and on behalf of the committee I would like to thank them both for their contribution to the work. Um, Richard Lyle in particular was here for longer, Rhoda not so long, but uh, thank them both very much. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item 7 in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And the second item on the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Climate Change Emissions Reduction Target Scotland Bill. This is the final evidence session on the Bill at Stage 1. And this morning I'm delighted to welcome the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform to the committee. And accompanying the Cabinet Secretary are her officials, Claire Hamilton, Deputy Director of Decarbonisation Division, Sarah Granger, the Team Leader of the Delivery Unit for Decarbonisation Div Division, and Simon Fuller, the Deputy Director of Economic Analysis, the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor. Welcome to you all. So, um, we'll move on to questions, and uh, I'll ask the first series of questions around the, the Paris Agreement and the re recent IPCC report. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, we've obviously put to many of our panels um, the question of whether they uh, think that the bill as it stands complies with the Paris agreement um, and, and I wanted to ask you what specific temperature target the bill is aiming for and whether you think the bill is adequate to comply with the Paris Agreement. Um, well when we originally requested advice from the Committee for Climate Change and I just uh, need to remind colleagues that that was in uh, I think June 2016 um, what we specifically asked them uh, to uh, to do is um, is to w was to request advice uh, on on bringing the the new legislation into accord with the Paris Agreement in general terms. So uh, what we got, uh, uh, what we asked for, is that it that it that the advice would represent an appropriate response to Paris, uh, as we understood it at that time, and given the best available evidence. Um, and that, of course, was an aim to limit global warming to well below two um, and to pursue further efforts to limit it to below 1.5. So that was the, the backdrop uh, uh, against which we asked for advice. Um, so we were asking in general terms uh, for advice that would bring us within that particular set of parameters. Um, the more recent request that has been made um, does ask for more specific advice um, it, it is, of course, some 18 months down the line, so we're in a different place. Um, and uh, the specific advice is for, uh, one, the range that emissions would need to be within to be an appropriate contribution to limiting warming to well below two. Um, and second, the range that emissions would need to be within to be an appropriate contribution to limiting warming to 1.5. But the, the response to our original uh, request to advice um, did give us, uh, and, and those few members that are left that were still on the committee <laughs> back at that point um, will understand that the committee did give us advice uh, in March 2017, um, which gave us two target ranges. Um, one was for below two degrees, um, and that one uh, was a target range between 78 and 87%. We were already committed to 80%, so arguably we were already committed to the, a target range that was below two. Um, and what the Committee uh, for Climate Change, and I understand is common parlance now, is a return to 1.5 degrees, which is an expectation that we may overshoot and then have to come back, not just us, but globally. Um, and that target range was 89 to 97%. And that was the one that 90% fell into. So that's how we've got to where we are at the moment. 
So last week we spoke to a number of stakeholders and we asked them the question of whether they thought that it complied with the Paris Agreement. Um, um, you know, Stop Climate Chaos, mm. WWF, and they all said no. But from what you've just said, it it is on target for as close to 1.5 as is practical. Yes, yes. And, and, and I think, you know, uh, you know, that is the advice that's coming from the Committee for Climate Change. Um, uh, that advice is dated March 2017, which is now uh, uh, 18 months, really, ago, uh, which is why we're needing to get the updated advice for us to be in a better position now to whether or not uh, the, that 89 to 97% that they were uh, flagging up to us then uh, is, is, is something that they would think that they need to to look at again and that's the basis on which we've understood it um i, I mean I, I hear the criticism but effectively that's criticism of the statutory advisors that are you know the the the, the government statutory advisors not just our statutory advisors but the statutory advisors to all the governments within the uk um, and I, I'm not quite sure where we would be if we simply set aside that advice and then launched ourselves on, on some other uh, way of gathering evidence. I'm just going to ask if, I mean, obviously there's a, a, a tremendous difference in, in terms of what the impact is between 1.5 and 2% of warming for Scotland. Has there been any work done on what the impact would be if, if it 2% rather than 1.5% here in Scotland? Um, specifically, that's I suppose so that's quite things. difficult to do because apart from anything else, we don't, you know, we don't have control over everything uh, here in Scotland. I mean, we chose the, the tougher of the two uh, uh, targets. We chose the, uh, you know, a target within the range that would, uh, quote, return to 1.5 degrees. Now, um, we went there because although the Committee for Climate Change said that that was uh, at the limit of feasibility, they were saying it was feasible and that, that it was possible to actually uh, construct a pathway to that. Um, so uh, uh, what will happen once we set those targets is that we will set about constructing that pathway um, and some of the work's already beginning, but we haven't done that in advance uh, uh, of this. Uh, um, and, uh, and as I indicated, um, that return to 1.5 degrees uh, indicates a target range of between 89 and 97%. So the 90% is at the bottom end of that target range, but that's what they're saying is at the limits of feasibility. Um, there may, I suppose, be some discussion in and around that range, unless the Committee for Climate Change comes back with a much more specific uh, um, uh, future prognosis in terms of net zero. Mm -hmm. and of course, since then, we've had the IPCC yes. report. Can I ask what your initial reaction uh, was to that report and how you anticipate that the bill may be, be amended to reflect some of the, the recommendations in there or the, the information in there? Well, I, I suppose at one level, uh, the reaction that we had was the same as everybody else would have, but at another level, I think we could all have anticipated that the IPCC was going to come come forward with something uh, like that. Um, I don't think um, at the moment uh, that we require to amend uh, the bill in, in terms of the IPCC report because we're already uh, on track with that bill to make the achievements that they're looking for, including being carbon neutral uh, by, uh, in our case, a set date by 20. Uh, by 2050 um, and, and uh, you know what we are proposing is within the parameters of what the IPCC were asking for. I think the IPCC um, it clearly is looking at the global scenario and uh, is anxious about some, those countries where really they're not uh, uh, not tackling it seriously enough or in some countries almost at this stage not tackling it at all. Mm. Um, so uh, you know from my point of view um, relatively comfortable, as, one, as comfortable as one can be, given the nature of what we're discussing here, that what we're proposing in Scotland um, is actually at the very top level of uh, what is achievable. So you've mentioned that the Committee for Climate Change, are, you're waiting on 
updated sure. advice from them. So, and we hear that they'll be responding to you by April. Given the ambition to complete the passage of this bill by summer recess, will that give you sufficient time to uh, incorporate their updated advice between stage two, stage three? Um, well, we'd hoped, I think all governments in the UK had hoped that the uh, advice would be by the end of March. Um, there are various different reasons for that from each government, but uh, uh, our, our desire was because of the passage of the Climate Change Bill, which was, of course, introduced uh, in June of the last session. Um, however, I'm not, uh, and I know from the government's perspective, I don't want to tie the bill too tightly to a timetable if it ends up meaning that we're proceeding without what I think is necessary advice. I think it would be an absurd position to be in. So uh, at the end of the day, it will be for the committee to negotiate in terms of parliamentary business how that happens. If we get the advice in April, I think it's still doable by June, but I don't want to make the June deadline, uh, deadline so hard and fast mm -hmm. that it doesn't allow for that advice coming a bit later than fits in our timetable. Um, I, I think we would all probably like to see it done and dusted in this parliamentary year. But I think it's more important that it's right. I think it's more important that it reflects the advice that we get than that we stick to a deadline in terms of timetable. OK, Mark Ruskell. You talked about the, the return scenario or the overshoot scenario where we go beyond the target temperature and then hopefully drop back down again. Does that, does that worry you in terms of the impacts that might occur on the back of that, in terms of environmental refugees, habitat species no, but, loss? Uh, but I think there are global issues here and global worries, um, absolutely. Uh, that was the, the, the advice that the Committee for Climate Change is giving us, and I expect that to be something that they might come back to uh, um, in, their, in their upcoming advice. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I think we are already seeing some impacts. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And there will be some global uh, effort required on the adaptation side and the, and the response side, uh, while over the next decades we struggle to get that temperature back down again. Um, uh, and those will really need, I think, to be global responses, particularly when it comes to issues like refugees, um, which at the moment globally doesn't look like a great picture. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm, I'm much heartened by the uh, Cabinet Secretary's uh, view that we, we, we need time to accommodate uh, the next report from the UK Climate Change Committee. I just wonder if, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to you be minded uh, as a government to um, ensure that if a, the committee were to decide it wanted to take evidence on that before stage three, that uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yes uh, that, 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 that this committee would be, that that would be consistent with any timetable uh, that the uh, government pursued, and indeed potentially uh, other options might be, of course, to have a, a, a chamber debate on on the, on the on the report before proceeding to stage three, because I'm, as I suspect others are, anxious to make sure that we give full consideration to, to, to that report before completing the legislative process. I'm not asking for a commitment at the moment, uh, Cabinet Secretary, because I guess you're not in a position to make that, and it's down to Parliament to some extent, merely asking whether the government would be prepared to collaborate and cooperate on that kind of basis. Yes, it, it won't be on my gift, in my gift, and it is a discussion uh, that will be had between the committee um, parliamentary business and, uh, and depending on chamber business, the bureau and, and presiding uh, presiding officer. I mean, I I I I'm, I I think that, that the fundamental thing here is I think that we get this right, n not that we do this fast. So I, I think that's the most important underpinning thing. And if that requires the committee to, you know, to think that they may need a little bit extra time, then I, I don't. I don't, personally, I don't see a problem with that, but of course it's not my decision at the end of the day. It will be the committee's decision in discussion with, uh, with the relevant authorities, and some of that's still, this many years later, still a bit of a mystery <laughs> as to how some of that comes out the sausage machine. John Scott. Well, well indeed, Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> um, 
but we might have to go back to a stage one position, even although we'd left the stage one position, would be my understanding to take evidence again. I think that's what Stuart Stevenson is suggesting in well, light of the I mean, I, I think that's evidence. a discussion that uh -huh. needs to be had. I, I, I'm, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, depending on what the Committee for Climate Change advice is. Yes. Um, the, 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 commitment, the, the commitment that's in the bill uh, as currently drafted in terms of reaching net zero as soon as, as practicable is, is such that it would be relatively easily amended from our perspective um, if the Committee for Climate Change comes back with advice that that is now a, a pathway. Um, uh, so that amendment at stage two, and I think that would be kind of how we saw it happening, uh, you know, would be a fairly straightforward amendment. I suppose at that point, it is the committee's, it is in the committee's decision as to whether or not they want to stop at that point and then go back and take more evidence. I, I, I won't be able to be in a position to, to decide that for you. And I call you Beamish. Thank you, Secretary, and um, to uh, those uh, supporting. Um, I'd like to focus our discussion into uh, some questions about the scope and implementation of the bill um, as we proceed. And uh, um, we've heard in, in evidence about the need for it to be transformational, and I think um, certainly this committee and many are all agreed on that. Um, given the number of tangible policies that we have heard of in oral evidence, um, has the government considered including in the bill um, what I would call policy pointers, um, which would support target delivery? And uh, just, um, I'm, I, I was recalling earlier today that um, in the 2009 bill, there were a significant number of, um, of um, policy mechanisms that would help drive towards the target, such as the um, single-use bags. And uh, uh, just to give a couple of examples of possibilities that have come up or, or which I would like to highlight, and there may be others that others would want to highlight, um, for, for this bill, a nitrogen budget, and possibly, um, although this hasn't come up in evidence yet, a stance on fracking in this bill to reinforce that, and also energy efficiency. So these are just some thoughts I've got, and others may have other ones. I wonder if you could respond to that. Well, OK. Um, it I understand, uh, 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 at least I kind of appreciate what the, the thinking is there, but, you know, we had to make a decision when we were doing this bill whether we were going to make this about targets um, or if we're going to start including what are effectively delivery options, then that would mean the bill could, you know, potentially become so enormous as to bring in things from every single portfolio and it just becomes... I think, in those terms, unmanageable, because the committee would then have to be taking specific evidence on very specific policy delivery options um, across who knows what range. And, and I would caution people from the temptation to start doing this, because, because, I mean, committees had a very recent example of what happens if you bring something in like that specifically, uh, um, and then uh, the, the processes are such that understanding the implications and uh, uh, being, uh, you know, being in a position to make an absolutely uh, uh, informed decision on it are, are vastly limited. Um, and, and I, you know, I appreciate where people are coming from, but is that really how, the, how we think the best way to handle it? No, uh, uh, I, I don't, because there could be any number of those things from across a whole range of policies. I mean, you know, Claudia Beamish has mentioned, for example, energy efficiency, but, but there, you know, there's a whole, you know, section of, of government already um, progressing issues on energy efficiency. There's already a huge amount of spend being committed to that. There's a, you know, fuel poverty uh, being dealt with in another part of government. There's, you know, these things, it's not that these things are not happening or uh, are, 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 are cannot be taken forward. Uh, but I'm not sure in a bill such as this uh, that would be the right thing to do. And we decided at the start that it wasn't particularly uh, appropriate um, to do that because effectively this is about resetting targets. At the end of the day, all of the policies that will be required to deliver on those targets will be dealt with in each of the portfolios. I agree that what I've, I've termed uh, 
policy pointers rather than the detail, as with the 2009 bill, would, would give some clarity to where we're going. And some of the things, um, you, Cabinet Secretary, you've highlighted energy efficiency. There's been a, a recent statement and strategy being developed. Um, there's, but on other areas that are very important, uh, for instance, with um, the Good Food Nation Bill, that appears to have been kicked into the long grass and it's just going to be a strategy. So, I mean, I understand what you're saying, that we can't have everything in there, but not everything was in there in 2009. Indeed, some of the point pointers weren't actually, haven't yet been implemented and may never be. But does it not give a confidence? Was that not the purpose then? That's an argument in favour of doing no, it then? Does it not give a... Well, some have and some haven't, but does it not give a confidence that there are... Um, policies that it's important to consider and maybe some of them might be quite controversial but you know such as um, some of the agriculture ones which um, there's a lot of uncertainty around. We would need to take very detailed evidence on some of these things yes and I well, just don't know what's happened. you know uh, I just don't know whether or not uh, uh, at that point you would really be uh, in the best position to do so no, over I'm, I'm a range of potential policies. There, hasn't it with the things that have been taken forward like um, with the single-use bags, that has happened at the point where I don't know it was that it necessary. was triggered by what went into the bill, though. I think well, that was I, happening I, anyway. I mean, I, I don't. Can, I mean, I, I, you know, it. it, it I, I mean, th th this is a kind of dis discussion about the nature of legislation, really. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know, you'll forgive me for reverting to my previous profession as a lawyer. You know, when you legislate for vagueness, you get vague legislation, and I don't know that that's particularly helpful in the long run. So there are, there are. I don't think this piece of legislation is the right place to start dealing with very, you know, specific. Now you're calling them policy pointers, but that that's very vague, um, uh, and there are plenty of other legislative opportunities as well as uh, other policy opportunities which to progress some of that. Um, believe me, every single one of my colleagues is going to be tasked on the basis of these targets uh, uh, um, to do precisely that in their own portfolio areas. And I've already begun to have bilaterals <coughs> with colleagues about that and about the implications of what we're proposing here. Right. Mr. Kim, that's supplementary on this thing. Just, just to back up what Claudia was saying, you know, throughout the evidence we've had uh, in the committee, that we've heard various policies that would help uh, reach uh, the targets uh, more urgently. So are, are you ruling out the, the, the need for uh, targets in the bill to be underpinned by supportive policies? No, I don't think that's what I've said. There's a difference between setting things in legislation and understanding what is required to achieve the legislative targets, which is what this bill is about. Uh, uh, if you set things in legislation, you're putting them on the face of legislation, and that has implications. So I think that, so I think that you know, it's, it's, it's really, I guess, a kind of slightly high-level discussion about what the nature of legislation is um, uh, uh, and, 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 and how government should proceed. And I, and I do caution everybody, we've just had a very recent example of what happens when things are brought in on a specific policy basis in a, in a more generalised bill uh, that uh, 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 people may feel, uh, and I think most of the committee probably did feel, that not enough evidence had actually been brought forward for them to make a properly informed decision on. So, you know, I, I, I just caution everybody uh, uh, about that. I understand the temptation, believe you me, <laughs> and I'm not saying that if I was sitting on the other side of this table, I wouldn't also be tempted, but the reality is that legislation is locking something down, you know, for the future. And right at the moment, we are in a stage at this point where we don't know what some of that might take because we're, we're you know, we're setting out on a course uh, uh, that, uh, that would mean that we wouldn't want to have our hands tied in certain directions. And if you aren't going to do that with legislative change, then, then what you put in the legislation becomes meaningless and, and ends up being a point of dispute, which I don't think anybody wants. Mm. Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks. Um, Convener, if I could uh, turn to the... Sorry, if, if I could turn to the proposed just transition commission um, now the government stated that uh, it considers not legislating uh, to be the most effective route uh, considering that and I quote providing a statutory basis for the commission would delay the work uh, 
we want it to undertake. Um, so why will placing the Just Transition Commission on a statutory footing delay work and what will be happening between now and June next year uh, with regard to the JTC? Well, first of all, there's obviously a debate over June next year. Um, so that's that's one issue. Uh, we're into a potentially, you know, fairly long legislative process. Um, secondly, uh, we've appointed uh, a chair uh, of Just Transition Commission already, um, and I will soon be uh, appointing members of that commission. The expectation is that that commission will meet in January um, at its first meeting with a, with a remit to deliver advice um, uh, within uh, two years. Um, we are able to do that because uh, uh, not having it legislated for gives us the fleetness of foot that enables that. If we put this in legislation, first of all, uh, I mean, I've no idea when this bill will get through stage three and when it will get the royal assent. So let's just presume for, uh, uh, you know, for purposes of, of, of generalisation um, that it, it gets through in June. It's got the royal assent maybe by autumn, uh, at which point it can then uh, come into being. But if you put the Just Transition Commission into legislation, at that point, effectively, I have to pause the existing Just Transition Commission. Okay? Uh, we have to then go through an entire public appointments process to appoint members of that commission. And that takes about four or five months. I know people may find that difficult to understand, but that is a, that is a, a procedure uh, which is, you know, if anybody's gone through it and understands it, it takes a very long time. You've then got to set up an independent secretariat. You've got all of the costs associated with that. And the likelihood is that you wouldn't have that set up, you know, until, I guess, at the very minimum, about a year later. Meantime, we've got a Just Transition Commission doing all of that work that we've had to stop because we now have this legislated for uh, um, uh, commission, which I don't think uh, uh, is going to aid us if we have to stop the work that, it's being do that is being done now. So, you know, because you can't have an appointed Just Transition Commission continuing when there is legislation requiring it to be on a legislative footing. If you put it on a legislative footing, then uh, you would have to have an argument about uh, how, how long it sat for. And I know there's a huge different set of views about how long this should sit for. Uh, therefore, the costs of it change depending on what that decision is. Meanwhile, there is a Just Transition Commission about to start work right now, give us advice in two years, and then at that point, we can then consider how best to, how best to progress and this will be the first one of its kind in the world. What we are doing right now with the Just Transition Commission is the first of its kind in the world. And I think it's far better that we crack on now uh, and deal with, some of the, uh, deal with some of the really important issues that the Just Transition Commission needs to deal with uh, rather than have, the, have the, the awkwardness of having to set up a statutory one uh, with all of that that entails in terms of cost, and time. Okay. To Mark Ruskell, before I come back to Claudia Beamish to finish this line of the question. If it's okay, convener, I just wanted to go back to that previous point about what goes in the bill, which, whether policies go in the bill or, or not. I mean, I suppose some of this comes down to confidence. How much confidence would the committee have in the other parts of legislation, the other parts of government, that they'll be able to pick up on whatever target is in the bill, whether that's net zero by 2050 or 2040 or whatever, and put in place the right policy provisions to drive that forward. So how much, how much reassurance can you give the committee that there is actually a plan B for the other parts of government, that if we end up with a higher target in the bill than what's currently here, then the legislative frameworks needed to deliver that will be put in place? Well, I would have expected the confidence would have come from Scotland having already reduced its um, uh, emissions by uh, 49% um, since 1990. So we are well on the way, well on track, and, and everything we are doing is at the very top level of ambition uh, of anything else in the world. I would have thought that in itself would give you, give you confidence. But, but in a sense, what you're asking me 
betrays one of the difficulties here, because you're going to try and second guess across all those portfolios what particular policy things that they should be doing and then lever them into this bill. I really think that is not the best way to progress. Um, and while I understand the temptation, I don't think it's an appropriate thing for us to be doing. So there is a fundamental difference, mm. I guess. I didn't necessarily approaches. say that I was. I was just putting it back to you to reassure me so that I don't have to. You know, I mean, I can only reassure you about this government's intentions. I can't reassure you about a future government of, mm -hmm. you know, of, of any future colour. Um, but then that's the same as with everything, because this legislation will bind us to targets um, and the policies that are used to achieve those targets may vary. I don't know. There may be lots of different alternative options. I don't know. That's one of the things I hope the Committee for Climate Change does give us good advice on. Of course, key to this is the climate change plan. Yes. Um, when can we expect uh, a new updated climate change plan to, to be published? Well, um, in a sense, that is a kind of follow-on discussion uh, because that is the, the way in which we are doing things. It's why we've taken the approach that we've taken just now uh, and uh, our, our ideas about uh, the next plan are under the 2009 Act, the next plan would have been due in late 2021-2022. Uh, so I go back to when we might expect this bill to go through, and we've only just come through a climate change plan process. So uh, there's, you know, do, do, we, do we get to the end of 2019 with an expectation that somehow we can, from scratch, do an entire new climate change plan in the space of a year? Well, it just took two years to do this one. Um, and, you know, or secondly, do we consider uh, effectively up, updating or, 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 or redoing the existing climate change plan to take account of whatever might end up being the targets in, in this bill. So, uh, um, I mean, that's, that's a kind of discussion that, uh, uh, that we need to have. Uh, and we need to have it um, as well because there's an issue about scrutiny period uh, for anything that we do um, as well. So... Uh, that is something uh, that I will look at as soon as the bill has passed through Parliament. And there is a difference if the bill gets through in June as opposed to if it ends up slipping into the following year. Um, and, I mean, I'll think about whether or not uh, it's, it's more appropriate to update the current plan in the short term or bring forward a very new plan quickly. But I need to say that bringing forward a new plan is effectively a 12 to 18 month minimum exercise. And if we're not starting that by the end of, until the end of 2019, and that's eff effectively starting a new plan almost as soon as the ink is dried on the Royal Ascent, you, you wouldn't get it in before the next Scottish parliamentary election. That's our, you know, we're, we're stuck with a parliamentary timetable whether we like it or not. So I need to think about that, and obviously we'll discuss this further with the committee as well. Claudia Beamish. Right. Uh, thank you, Convener. Could I just go back very briefly, Cabinet Secretary, to the uh, Just Transition Commission? And uh, you, in, it, it's surely a question of, of balance, and you've used, you used the phrase awkwardness and, uh, but in, in your remarks just then about, about the fact that there is at present, I don't want to summarise what you've said because we've heard it and the official report hears it, but um, I, I just really do ask you again um, for a view about the, the fact that whenever we are going to set the targets for net zero, whether it's whenever it is, that the whole thrust must have uh, the, the, um, the fair way forward for communities and for affected workers and so surely that awkwardness of the complexity of having an interim uh, one which I'm, I'm delighted is in existence must be weighed up against the importance of whatever government we have just like with the targets that this would drive forward a fair way and and so I have real concerns about the just um, tra uh, transition commission not being actually on a statutory basis. 
I don't think it follows, and I think you're falling into the trap of assuming that the Drust Transition Commission is the only place where these conversations uh, are actually happening and being taken forward. I mean, we have, we have a number of uh, other uh, uh, things. I mean, the, the climate change uh, plans um, uh, and all Scottish Government policies are subject to impact assessment duties, and that's Equalities Impact Assessment and a Fairer Scotland Duty Assessment, where it's appropriate. Um, so uh, uh, that, that purpose of the Fairer Scotland duty is to ensure that those living on low incomes, and that's not just about employment, of course, but those living on low incomes are not disproportionately disadvantaged as a, as a result of policy decisions. And in some of the targets of the bill, we have to consider uh, various uh, criteria, and that includes social circumstances. Um, there was an equality impact assessment, children's rights and wellbeing impact assessment, and a Fairer Scotland assessment, all done for the bill proposals. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and actually, that's one of the reasons why we haven't thus far set the net zero target date at this time, because until we have a credible pathway, then there may be some negative social consequences, which we don't want, uh, which we don't want to see. So it isn't the case that these things aren't being looked at. They're not all going to be uh, uh, simply in the Just Transition Commission, uh, Commission there's going to be a, a lot of other areas in government uh, uh, policy that are also taking these things on board. Um, so I don't know uh, an argument that the Just Transition Commission has to be on a statutory basis um, uh, necessarily follows. But in any case, I go back to the fact that once you legislate for it, for a Just Transition Commission, effectively you're stopping, as I understand it, the current Just Transition Commission from continuing. Uh, and it would take uh, uh, some considerable time, uh, effort and cost to set up uh, a, a statutory Just Transition Commission. Uh, so we would be losing, you know, a year at least uh, of really, really important work that I don't think we have time to lose. So it's a case of, you know, do we press ahead now, which is why we've done what we've done, rather than wait for it to be in a statutory, on a statutory basis, or, or, or not. So we're pressing ahead. I'm sorry if going too fast is a problem, but uh, we're doing Cabinet it. Cabinet Secretary, I've never <laughs> said we're going too fast, and I've never uh, criticised the, just for the record, the Just Transition uh, Commission. I'm simply saying there's a lot of uh, robust argument, including from unions and NGOs and businesses, for why we should put it on a statutory footing, and I would have thought that there could be a way that we could move forward towards that, so that whatever government we have, um, we, we have that inclusive uh, partnership of dialogue. But that's just a different view, so we'll mm. perhaps agree, okay. agree to differ. Angus MacDonald would like to ask some questions on this theme. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, we have, we have uh, basically covered the Just Transition Commission, however, it probably is uh, fair to put on record that, uh, and, and I think it's fair to say that, uh, the majority of the stakeholders that we have asked um, would be keen to, to, to see it on a, a statutory footing. But if, if I could follow on from, from all of that and, and look at the um, transformational change, um, evidence to date uh, has shown that there's a need, you know, clearly we all see that there's a need for transformational change mm -hmm. and that this should be systemic rather than just at an individual level. Uh, it's also been noted that there's uh, no all-voluntary future, uh, and that climate change cannot be solved without statutory backstops. Um, so I'd be keen to uh, hear, Cabinet Secretary, how can transformational change be achieved whilst retaining sectoral and societal buy-in? And, for example, are there limits to public acceptability, and to what extent can transformational change be voluntary? Um, well, I guess I have to preface everything uh, I, I say in respect of this uh, with a reminder that we live in a democracy. Um, and uh, in a democracy, everything that you do has to have, if not the explicit, at least the implicit support of the majority. Uh, it is possible for governments to take forward fairly um, ambitious uh, things. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've seen uh, a smoking ban introduced in Scotland. We've got minimum pricing for alcohol. Uh, um, I think there was probably, it, it's fair to say, and that's two different governments, so I think it's probably fair to say that there was a degree of uh, muttering uh, in certain quarters about both of those proposals. Um, uh, and uh, uh, members of the public who weren't particularly 
on board, but nevertheless, I think there was an implicit understanding that these were tackling problems that needed to be tackled, uh, and therefore, mm, maybe in some cases a bit reluctantly, in some cases more enthusiastically, people were willing to accept that that was, you know, if not their preferred, nevertheless, a reasonable option for taking things forward. And I think that's really important to make a statement at the outset about that implicit need, that need for that implicit support, if not absolutely explicit. Now, I think climate change is on the verge of becoming part of that scenario. Uh, I mean, th there was a recent survey, I think, I, I'm not, was it the household survey? Mm -hmm. Sur household survey that does show that the, the, the co concern about climate change is beginning to penetrate into uh, a majority of, of, of households, majority of people's minds. So that's an important indicator to us that there are, there is the possibility of being able to push forward um, in respect of policies that relate to climate change that may also accrue that, if you like, implicit uh, uh, buy-in. Um, but that buy-in is really, really, really important and you have to know that you're going to get it. And there are some areas where I think it will be easier than others and some areas where it will be harder in terms of policies, but also there may be some sections of the community for which it is easier uh, and harder. Uh, um, so it isn't a, a straightforward across the board game here. Um, it's something that we really, really do uh, uh, have, to, uh, have to engage in um, uh, at every level, and the behaviour change has to be at every level. One of the things that frustrates me very slightly is that we, 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 we jump this debate from what government is doing to what individuals are doing without their looking at the range of other groups within that and institutions within that. Uh, and it's not just public institutions, but it's private institutions as well. So, so the behaviour change you know, can be driven by exemplars and, and, and you know, people's, for example, if you work for a big private company that begins to make some of those statements and make some of those changes themselves, that also helps build that, that implicit buy-in that we want across the board. So I don't want the conversation to just be about, here's government, what's it doing? And here's the individual, what are they doing? But there's a whole range of behaviour changes in between that, uh, which I think are necessary as well. Um, so I think it is really, really important. Um, we need to make sure that people know what technological changes are coming along that will help in this regard. Uh, uh, we need to uh, make sure um, that we change uh, our approach to, to, to behaviour change uh, as a government. Um, and in fact, last week we announced uh, that we'd finished a review of the, pu of the current public engagement strategy um, that came under the 2009 Act. Um, and our conclusion is that we do need to revise that strategy uh, to ensure uh, what we do is commensurate with the targets within this bill. So we know that that's a constantly changing scenario um, uh, and one that we have to make sure we're abroad. And I don't, know, I don't know whether colleagues were aware of that issue about the review of climate change behaviour issues. Okay, um, clearly, you know, we all welcome, we are thinking about it. Yeah. We, we, we all welcome the, the, the behaviour change that, that is happening, but are there any plans for statutory backstops? To, oh, I don't know what to, you mean to, by to statutory ensure, backstops. To ensure and encourage um, further behavioural change. You know, will there be... I don't think you can legislate for behaviour change. I think what you're, what you're doing um, is... is is constantly engaging um, and, and encouraging. We have uh, uh, 10 key behaviours that we've identified, that we identified previously and we still do now, uh, um, but uh, um, uh, uh, and we have an existing public engagement strategy which I just, just referred to. Um, uh, so we are going to publish a refresh strategy as, as soon as possible. Um, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, referring back to Cabinet Secretary's previous point about many of the policies needed to be taken forward at a, um, in different portfolios, um, one example that possibly touches on your question, if I'm understanding it right, is the work that's happening in the Energy Efficiency Scotland programme. 
which involves quite a lot of behaviour change, the way people use their heating systems and um, the way homeowners, um, what, what decisions they make to insulate their homes, for example. And there is um, consideration being given to how to encourage homeowners to um, put in place better insulation and, and when to stop encouraging and to absolutely require homeowners to um, insulate their properties better. It's obviously huge costs to homeowners, so it's been very, very carefully considered. Um, but if, if that's the kind of behaviour change that you're talking about, that, that, those conversations um, and considerations happen at, uh, in the particular portfolios. OK, thanks. Thank you. Right, moving on. Um, yeah, very quick question from John. Thank you. Um, I'm declaring an interest, Cabinet Secretary. How will Scottish economy and society have to change, in your view, to achieve a 90% target and a net zero target? What change would you foresee? Well, um, it's difficult to foresee change on the net zero because that's precisely what the Climate Change Committee said they couldn't see in terms of a pathway. Um, if, if you go to net zero without there being a pathway, then you're, you're effectively into a sort of high-level guesswork, really. Um, in terms of what we consider to be uh, stretching, uh, uh, um, well, what the UK Committee for Climate Change thought was uh, um, was feasible, but at the outside of feasibility, the 90% um, will require every sector of society really to be thinking about this and to be making to be making changes. Um, I think it's challenge it's challenging for us in terms of transport, and it's challenging for us in terms of well the obvious ones that people have already flagged up because uh, the the energy transformation is already in place and will I think proceed. Um, as quickly as it has already been. The, the, the challenges are in buildings, but we're dealing with that through the fuel poverty and the energy efficiency side of things. Um, agriculture, which I know this committee um, will often come back to, and, uh, uh, and also transport, which again uh, is, is something that I've already had conversations with my colleague Michael Matheson about. Because, and that, and if, it, if I can go back to... Um, the comment I made about behaviour change and the need for us not to jump from the government level automatically to the individual level, there are a whole range of bodies out there that, that I think need to be challenged about some of their, for example, policies around their car fleets and their, their you know, uh, at what point will they be making the transition to uh, low emission vehicles, at what point, so when we are being called on to, to increase uh, targets, I, I think it's fair to ask them, well, when does your institution expect mm -hmm. to do these things? W what are your plans? So I think that there are, there's a variety of different things that might be taken on board. Adding all of them up uh, is something that we will have to do, and that will be part of our consideration around the climate change plan issue that, that we discussed earlier. So would it be fair to say then that you're prepared to see that type of change, that societal change, not brought about by what's on the face of the bill necessarily, but in the different portfolios that other cabinet secretaries are in charge of in terms of delivering it, you having charged them to deliver? Effectively, that is how we how we progress and that's how we've got to where we are um, just now and I have as I indicated I've, I've you know started to have direct conversations um, with colleagues in the in the most affected or the most likely to be affected areas to flag up um, the need for them to go back notwithstanding that they've just come through the climate change plan process they need to go back and start to think more ambitiously in each of their portfolios about what can be delivered um, uh, and uh, as I said, however, I, I think this is a task for everybody. It can't just be government that does this. It will also have to be uh, uh, at, at every level uh, uh, of society. Um, and, you know, if we're going to say, uh, well, we want the need for um, fuel, uh, uh, fossil fuel vehicles to be phased out by 2032, I'd like to hear about what companies and uh, 
other institutions are doing in respect of, of their own activities and their own provisions. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm a bit naughty um, sometimes when I have these conversations, but you know, when I, when I, when I get the calls uh, I, that I want to say, for example, to the Church of Scotland and the Catholic Church, well, when are you going to tell your priests and ministers that they are not going to be permitted to buy a fossil fuel car? What, what, uh, you know? <laughs> but these are the decisions that will have to be made, and you know, I, I want to hear back from some of the organisations what their decisions are going to be. Uh, as well. So it's not just good enough to call for the targets, it's also everybody has to buy in. Um, and I'm not asking everybody around this table when they plan on doing this, but it's an individual decision, it's an institutional decision, and it's a government decision, all wrapped together. You don't have a particular biblical reference to back up that <laughs> On ultra-low emission vehicles, sadly not. I, I, I'll try, uh, I'll try a... <laughs> I'll, I'll try to seek on one, that. but I'm sure there is one somewhere that will that will suffice. There usually is. There may even be a Shakespearean reference that does the job as well. But I, I think I'm trying to make the point here that that the effort required is an effort at every level of society, and I am concerned about jumping from the from the from the high level government right down to the individual behaviour and putting it on the individual's shoulders when actually there's a range of things in between there that, that we can reasonably expect to see uh, movement on as well. Okay. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. I think the Cabinet Secretary was maybe uh, struggling to go for the Tower of Babel. The biblical reference. Right. Uh, but, but, we could but, have a but, theological discussion if well, you want. In, in, indeed, on another occasion, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I just wanted to explore a wee bit about the targets and, and in particular, uh, the substantial pressure that's come from many of the stakeholders who've appeared in front of the committee uh, for setting a net zero target uh, sooner uh, rather than later. Uh, but I, I just before I go to that, I wanted to just develop a little bit of what's come before um, and ask whether in considering particular policies that clearly uh, might advance the climate uh, change agenda, like electrifying the car fleet, um, whether, of course, that might not have adverse effects if improperly implemented. So, for example, uh, given the substantial sunk costs in carbon terms, new vehicles. It would be unhelpful if you doubled the size of the car fleet, which you might do if you, if you thought it was carbon, zero carbon to use it because of the sunk costs. And I was thinking of the Renewable Heat Initiative in Northern Ireland, which was a good idea if you replaced a boiler with a better boiler. But what actually happened was you had an awful lot more boilers installed, so the effect was negative, not positive. And I think those are, that, I mean, that's an important um, issue to raise because effectively, um, uh, when you're looking at a policy option, you have to, you have to think about the whole life of, of either the item or, or the, uh, uh, the whole consequences of the introduction. And that goes, you know, that will apply to virtually any one of the delivery decisions that you, you try to make. Uh, and also a lot of the delivery decisions may very well be predicated on a technology which at the moment we're not certain is actually the right way to go, which is another issue that has to be considered. We're, we're you know, I think in a lot of things at the moment, we're at the VHS versus Betamax level of, of the debate. So who would have been able to predict necessarily who, which one was going to be the technology that everybody went for. I'm not sure we're in that in that space uh, with some of these technologies. And that is a complication. And it's a complication that, you know, has to be looked at for all of of the the kind of proposals that um, that I see being being mooted. It, not just in evidence to this committee, but out there and we all read them and see them as well. And I, and I think, well, there are some real consequences if you go down that road. Um, uh, and the consequences might not be immediately evident when you make a superficial call or, a, or, or, uh, or introduce a policy without proper evidence. I mean, that's in very general terms. Um, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to get drawn too far into a discussion about cars. I've never owned one in my life, so I don't really have much of a, of a, of a, of a kind of 
feeling for that. Uh, but I am conscious that, yes, uh, you know, proliferation of cars in and of itself may not be the best thing to happen um, for a lot of different reasons. So, you know, and the speed with which one can do the changeover is another issue. But, but it is obviously where we have to go and that would have to be managed. And I think that there are people who've questioned the, 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 you know, the increase the increasing electricity use that would be required if you're actually going down that road too. So these are all things that have to be factored into, you know, um, a decision about cars. And then, of course, there will be the argument, well, of course, the idea should not be increasing the use of cars, but increasing use of public transport instead. Um, and all of that has to be taken into consideration. Okay. Um, one of the, uh, the, the areas where perhaps the speed of changeover is... Um, probably today capable of being seen as particularly difficult would be the agricultural sector. Um, is the government thinking about uh, the balance it could have uh, if, for example, uh, we were to move ahead with something we probably know we can do, which is to up our uh, exports of zero emission electricity, because we have a huge potential for renewable energy, which would take you towards net zero with potentially without doing anything to agriculture. Is, is that part of the thinking or are there particular things in relation to the feasibility of what can be done in agriculture that are engaging uh, the government at the moment? Um, well, I'm having conversations with my colleague, uh, um, Fergus Ewing, uh, about uh, some of this. Um, I've had meetings with an, a, a range of uh, agricultural associations uh, um, uh, on this particular, on, on, on these things. So they're in no doubt that uh, 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 effectively there's a bit of tough love needs to go on. They do need to make changes. Uh, I think they're aware of that. But there are some real issues about making changes uh, uh, as well. I mean, you can't produce food without emissions. There isn't, there isn't a way anywhere in the world to produce food without emissions. So there will always be agricultural emissions. Um, and therefore, to a certain extent, there will always be the need to be balancing off. Now, whether you balance off in a calculation which is about exporting you know, renewable electricity or you balance it off in a different way um, is, is, is a matter for the way things uh, progress. Um, so the issue with agriculture, with food production, is to reduce emissions as, as, as far as is reasonable um, manageable and doable, given the current understanding and the current uh, 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 tools that we have available. Um, but you will never get that within that sector to zero. You're never going to get that down to zero because, because producing food, which is a fairly fundamental thing that we all have to do, is in and of itself going to produce emissions. Those emissions to other countries well, no, as well by making it too onerous for people uh, to I mean there is there here. is an issue and, and I don't you know that, that that is a big question mark over um, some of the ideas that float about in respects of people's diets and all the rest of it that would simply in my view shift emissions and in a global sense that's not particularly helpful. Um, uh, so if 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 we offshore emissions because of decisions we make um, that's the other side of the coin that Stuart Stevenson is raising. He's, he's talking about us being able to balance by other, other mechanisms within our economy, but equally you may end up offshoring emissions, uh, and that's not a particularly helpful thing either. OK, I'm going to come to Mark Ruskell and then Finlay Carson. Um, yeah, I'm just, just wondering where the evidence is, though, for that offshoring argument. I mean, I think the World Bank produced a report a couple of years ago that says environmental policies have been found to induce innovation to offset part of the cost of compliance with environmental policy. I suspect they do both. I suspect they both encourage innovation, but they also run the risk of that offshoring. And, and I need to remind everybody that we are making decisions within Scotland, which is a devolved part of the whole UK. And if our climate change targets uh, um, uh, encourage businesses to move south of the border. It's an easy, easy thing for them to do, but doesn't help us. So, you know, 
from our perspective, given that we've got domestic targets here in Scotland, offshoring means even the rest of the UK, much less going elsewhere completely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, I think both are obviously things that can happen. Mm -hmm. uh, innovation, absolutely, and Scotland has a great history of it and continues to do so, even in, you know, particularly in these areas. But I do think there is also a risk. It is why, um, for example, Norway has set a net zero, has said, it hasn't set a target because it hasn't legislated, but it has said that it will go to net zero by 2030 if other countries do the same. Mm -hmm. So that's what's driving their ambition is ensuring that they don't get themselves so out of kilter with, with, uh, with neighbouring countries that they don't end up effectively causing themselves a problem by simply having you know, parts yeah. of their economy disappearing yeah. over the you, borders. You've spoken very negatively about net zero target. Um, I, I don't think I've heard a positive argument from yourself, Cabinet Secretary, or any of your officials um, in, in the last year or so. C can you see any advantages to the economy, for example, of setting a net zero carbon target? Uh, if we didn't, we wouldn't be asking the Committee for Climate Change for advice. The point about the net zero target is, right at the moment, we don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can get advice about how to get there, we've said right from the outset, from the very moment this bill was introduced, that it's introduced in such a way as to allow us to amend it, immediately there is a pathway to it. Um, so it's not, about, uh, uh, it's not about being negative. It's about uh, needing to be credible, needing to be realistic, uh, and needing to see what would actually be a way to get to it. Um, we're already... Uh, uh, amongst the most ambitious countries in the world uh, for, uh, uh, for achieving uh, uh, emissions reductions, but and that you, isn't going to change. But, but do you see any advantages to the economy of setting a net zero target and driving that innovation? Do you see any advantages in, in being a first mover on technologies rather than waiting to see what Norway does and then adopting it somewhere down the line? No, I don't think that's what I was saying. The point I was making is that if we set out on a target without knowing how to get there, um, then we do run a real risk of making some serious mistakes. And I want to get the advice from the Committee for Climate Change before we embark on that. But the minute that advice comes, the minute they say, yes, here is the pathway, then this government will adopt that. Finn Carson. Thanks. Um, Back to agriculture, and in particular the, the 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 red meat sector, and on the basis that we've got to remember that we're only 75% self-sufficient when it comes to beef. But throughout the evidence sessions, we've heard it may not be enthusiasm, but certainly a an acceptance and uh, open-mindedness when it comes from both the academic, or the the college sector, and farmers themselves that there are more the the, the sector can do. Um, but between 90% uh, and net zero, we would suggest that most of that's down to NOxes, uh, and a lot of that will then be down to agriculture and transport. Um, about six months ago, there was uh, lots of uh, rumours going around or whatever, or, or a bit of scaremongering uh, to suggest that if uh, the government were to go for net zero, it would decimate the red meat industry in Scotland. Is that your belief? I think at the moment one of the challenges would be um, because it isn't it, the, the the residual gases that that we're talking about other than CO2. It's not just nitrogen, but it's also methane, and I think methane is a particular issue for uh, for meat production. Uh, um, uh, but but there is a there is a kind of bigger, and it goes back to some of what Stuart Stevenson was 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 kind of generally asking about. There is a bigger issue. Um, uh, uh, about about meat production as it's seen globally, as opposed to how it's managed in Scotland, and I think there's a um, there's a tendency to generalise globally, but because something is done a, one way in many countries in the world, is that what's happening here? There's a lot of work being done on this, and I'm very conscious of that. And I know that the farmers, uh, particularly those who are who are running beef cattle and and sheep. Um, are very, very aware of this, but we need to remember that something like, and I don't know what the percentage is, something like 86% uh, of agricultural land in Scotland is, is what's called less favoured areas. And it wouldn't take a lot, particularly 
uh, on the hill farms who are already on very marginal incomes, it wouldn't take much to tip them over the edge and end uh, and then end their kind of businesses. And I'm really conscious of that. And we, you know, we've had a long discussion about just transition, but just transition isn't just about, you know, workers. It's also about uh, uh, consumers. It's also about individuals, but it would also be about um, uh, uh, some of the farming sectors, because I know that uh, uh, you know some of the some of the farmers that we are talking about are are, are living off incomes that range between fourteen thousand and eighteen thousand, which frankly, you know, for most people would be astonishing. But so so we have to be incredibly careful what decisions we make here, and what that what that actually means. We've got eighty six percent of agricultural land in Scotland. Um, is less favoured area. Not, not land that is suddenly going to grow carrots and potatoes. That's land that really isn't suitable for any other form of food production. So these are all things that we need to take into account when we're thinking about it and the impacts of some of the decisions that might be made. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm as conscious of that as anybody uh, is and should be. Because there are real impacts for real people. Yeah, because there was a document published just around the Highland Showtime which suggested that the, the meat production in Scotland would be decimated. That was the suggestion if the decision was taken to go to net zero. Um, I, I, think, I think what you will find is, I mean, we certainly uh, produced an analysis that said without having a specific way forward uh, as a pathway, then, then that would be an enormous pressure. That difference between 90 and net zero would be an enormous pressure for food production, um, and particularly for the production uh, for meat production. Uh, um, and there is, and, and, and I think you know, I, I can't imagine anybody here is not aware of the widespread discussion there is about rapid dietary change being required that would end up by 2050 with nobody eating meat at all. Well, if nobody's eating meat at all, then the implications are pretty, um, uh, uh, pretty you know, enormous for anybody who is currently making a living, however marginal, from the production of meat. Um, so yes, I think that is a, you know, there is a real concern about that and about managing that. But that's how, why, in a sense, you have to work with farmers to try and get them to a place where uh, we understand what it is they're doing, how they can get their emissions down as far as possible, and then use them as a balance and, and use some of the balancing off from from other areas. Uh, uh, because at the end of the day, we all need food. Now, you know, food has to be produced, and even when you're not eating meat, the, the plants still have to be raised. The, the 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 whatever you eat is going to have been produced with emissions. Um, so uh, I, I think that we just have to be careful about the impact here of, of what changes, you know, what the changes might mean for particular sectors. Yeah, but I suppose right now, with evidence we know, if you were to suggest to go to net zero, your belief at the moment with the information you know is that it would decimate um, well, I, I don't production. use words so, like decimate, but I, I, you know, I, I'm, what I understand to be the case is that that would be one of the areas where you would need to pretty much be quite uh, 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 draconian in, in the decision making. And the point I'm making here is that here is also a just transition issue because, you know, we, we have people producing food on land which will not produce any other food if they are if they are no longer uh, uh, going to farm. Um, and we already import a significant amount of, of, and if we're going to stick to meat, we already uh, import a significant about, amount of meat. And the danger is, if we increase the imports of meat, all we do is increase emissions somewhere else. So, it, it, and that's back to this complicated kind of equation going on uh, between a decision we make here and the potential on emissions reductions. You know, it could uh, positively affect our emissions reductions, but negatively affect, you know, other countries' emissions reductions. And, you know, that's why it's complicated. I don't have an easy answer to that, but, you know, everything I read that suggests 
we all have to be vegetarian, if not vegan, by, 2020, by 2050, presupposes nobody in Scotland is there for producing meat. So I don't see you know, how the consequences of that are anything other than pretty drastic, and in those circumstances, have to be thought through very, very carefully indeed. Yeah, I'm, tr just, I'm trying not to be yeah. alarmist about this. I am aware that there was some discussion around the RHS that, that perhaps got a bit alarmist. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, I think it is an important issue that you, you, you know, make a decision in one place that has consequences in another. Other places. I, just, I want to bring back, uh, you'll have seen the evidence that we got from our Swedish colleagues, um, in particular is Anders Weikman, a uh, politician over in Sweden, talked about Scotland's ambition very positively, yet over here, Sweden is also pointed to as being the epitome of, you know, the, the net zero target and whatever, but it, they have a quite a different system compared to, have a quite different policies and targets compared to what we have here. Um, I, I mean, I, I just think that one, one of the things which I, I guess has surprised me most about doing this job is the extent to which I took it as, as read that when I saw international comparisons, everybody was comparing like to like, and that simply isn't the case. Um, the more I understand it, the more I realise uh, you know, that, that actually what one country says and does um, compared to another country can, can vary quite considerably and makes it almost impossible then to do a straight read across. Um, and I, I think it's one of the weaknesses of the, the system internationally. Uh, that that is the case, um, and, and I, you know, I don't have it within my gift to fix that, but it is one of the things I think ought to be fixed because it's very hard when you look at what another country says it's doing. It's very hard to know how that actually compares to what to what you're choosing to do. So yeah, Sweden is, and, and we still refer to it as 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 in the forefront of this, and that we are second only to Sweden, but you know. I mean, they will. They don't include. Anders they said, said that, that about us. So yeah. maybe there's an interesting debate going on in Sweden that says Scotland is way ahead of us and, we, and all the rest of it. I don't know because I'm only in, involved in this domestic debate. Um, but but you know the the, the issue of um, the Lulu CF, the land use land use change forestry sector. There are countries that simply don't include it at all. And why? If I ask the ministers, oh, because it would be too difficult and, you know, it wouldn't be very good and it wouldn't be, you know. So Ireland doesn't include Lulu CF. Uh, the reason it doesn't include Lulu CF is because Ireland is running four peat fire power stations. So they just don't include Lulu CF in, the, in, the, in, their, in their kind of announcement so you know so there are other countries and we're including a domestic a share of, of international shipping and aviation other countries don't uh, uh, I don't think Sweden does there's the whole issue of carbon credits you know which is a uh, which is another question entirely and our approach has been very different uh, in terms of that so I mean I, I find it a bit frustrating because I always want to look behind now what the announcements are and it's the reason I raised Norway because Norway you know made an announcement about net zero by 2030 but when you looked behind it a it's not statutory and b is predicated on on sets of things which which you know mean arguably that it is is, is a challengeable uh, um, policy target um, uh, compared to the way we do things which is very kind of constrained by legislation and with annual targets. I mean, I think we are the only country in the world that does annual targets. We're the only country in the world where the government has to come to Parliament every single year and explain why, you know, that set of greenhouse gas emission stats is what it is. There isn't another country in the world where a climate change minister has to do that. Why would we not be saying that we are amongst the most ambitious in the world in those circumstances? It's a good point to turn into the um, interim targets with John Scott and uh, other members. I'll try and bring you in um, after. I'm just I'm moving the agenda along so that we get through everyone's questions. I'll... Thank you. Um, before I do have a question on the last subject, and I'm not really setting out to be awkward, please accept that at the outset, Cabinet Secretary, but you will be aware, you will be aware of the, <laughs> the 
revolutionary work in terms of methane reduction in cattle, in terms of seaweed in Queensland, in Northern Australia, where this, in laboratory conditions, this work gives a 90% reduction in methane output from cattle. And some of our research institutes are already aware of that and looking at that. <clears throat> Were it to be discovered that seaweed around Scotland shared the same properties that seaweed apparently on the Great Barrier Reef has that could facilitate this methane reduction in cattle in Scotland, how would we harvest <laughs> such a seaweed? Hey, um, <laughs> I, I, I think in these circumstances, this, this conversation could end up kind of simply reiterating one that we've already had. Um, it, the easy answer to that might be that, you know, obviously there's a real potential for farming, um, seaweed farming, which uh, I think all of us can agree would be a good way forward. Um, uh, I don't know the details of the research. I am aware that there's a lot of work being done around the world on the issue of methane. Um, uh, and we need to just be absolutely clear that, 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 that the scientific research will work uh, in terms of its practical implications in, in Scotland. But I'm sure that both uh, officials in the Scottish Government and the farmers themselves will be watching this very, very carefully because, yes, it could well become uh, a, a very advantageous way to proceed if the research is borne out in practice. Many thanks. Um, and now address the questions that the convener asked me to address, <laughs> which is the adequacy of interim targets. And given the 2020 target is on course to be achieved, is it challenging enough? Okay, so there's a, a kind of slightly existential question there, which is, is a target only a good target if it can't be achieved, in which case you will come and beat us around the head because it hasn't been achieved. So in that sense, we can't win. We can't win if we set a target however stretching that is achievable, because if we don't achieve the target, then, then we're seen to have failed as well. I, I, you know, I don't know what the easy answer to that is. All we can do is set targets that seem to be realistic and credible on the basis of the evidence we have at the time we're setting the targets. And at the time in 2009, <coughs> we, we, we set targets mm -hmm. which have turned out to be more achievable, mm -hmm. but you couldn't have foreseen in 2009 some of the things that actually happened subsequent to that. So. So I agree with you. It should be a matter of celebration that we've achieved the targets rather than beating ourselves all ahead for not having achieved a target. Uh, why has the Scottish Government decided to take a linear emissions reduction pathway to 2050 um, when we are told, I think, in evidence that the, the risk is, is exponential? Although I would take some, I need to have a discussion with Stuart Stevenson about the risk being exponential, if that's the right scale that's being used there. Um, but um, why have you decided to take a, a linear emissions reductions pathway to 2050? Because well, we are, uh, I mean, first of all, we are constrained within the way our, our, we do things here in terms of the climate change plan, etc., that has to set out you know, progress towards 20, you know, the, the, the final target of 2050 and show uh, at each stage how we're going to get there. So to a certain extent, that kind of binds us into a, a kind of linear, uh, a linear way of thinking. Um, it is always easier um, to look in the short to medium term because you have greater degree of confidence about what might or might not be required and, and available. It's harder into the longer term uh, to know I mean, I, I, if, if I think about the difference, we, we are, what, not quite at 2020. So if, if I try to think about 2040, for example, well, that's the equivalent of the year 2000. I mean, some of the things, you know, that we're doing now would have been unthinkable, unforeseeable um, just 20 years ago. So there is a, there is a constraint around that. Uh, um, so I think the way we try to do things at the moment is the best way possible. I'm not sure what the alternative would be to not having linear, uh, not having linear targets, Sarah. Well, the, the other way to answer the question is not why do we have linear targets, but why do we not have any of the other things that we could have? So we could, for example, have steps. Mm -hmm. um, sort of when we expect technology to sort of come on stream, mm -hmm. but that's that, that, that really becomes a, a, a guessing game and betting on which year things are gonna come in. 
Um, another possibility would be either to have a curve one way or the other, either with greater effort in the near term, but we already have the most ambitious targets in the world for 2020 and 2030, and as the Cabinet Secretary has made clear, we think credibility is very important, so we don't think we can do anything more, uh, more in the nearer term. Um, and we, as, <laughs> I'm inventing it. Um, whereas doing less in the near term and more later, um, I think we took the assumption that that wouldn't be acceptable to stakeholders or the parliament. So that kind of leaves us with a linear pathway. I see. <laughs> I, I, no, I do see. And I, but notwithstanding, I mean, and there are reasonable questions to be asked. I mean, why should we wait until after 2030 for more rapid decarbonisation when certainly in evidence we've been told that the tools already exist in many sectors, they just need to be applied. Much of the technology is already there. It may be just the cost of, of, of doing it sooner rather than later. I see Mr Fuller nodding his head sagely there um, from the Finance Department of Government, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know, I, I mean, I suppose you could have this conversation ad, ad nauseum, really. I mean, this is about trying to uh, progress, make changes, uh, but keep in mind all of the other issues that we have to think about in terms of consequences, in terms of just transition, social justice and all the rest of it. So, and, and that's why, you know, if I go back to everything has to be both credible and realistic because we have to be in a position to actually make these changes in a way that isn't going to damage sections of society. Now, I know there's a bigger argument about if you don't make the changes, then there is damage coming anyway from climate change. But that's why, you know, we're trying to set out the, the long-term targets that we are and trying to ensure that all of the things that we do uh, uh, work through that balance. Uh, I mean, this is a challenge for every single country. Um, I think Scotland is, 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 um, is meeting that challenge uh, far better than virtually any other country. Uh, are we doing it perfectly? Perhaps not. And maybe there is a point, you know, 20, 30 years in the future with hindsight, uh, everybody will be able to sit in this room and it won't presumably be us um, and look back and say they should have said X and Y and Z. But we can only we can only make these decisions on the basis of the information that we have right now. And that's what we're doing, um, uh, whether it be in terms of energy uh, and we have made rapid changes in 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 decarbonising energy, and that will continue apace, or whether it will cut right across all the all the other portfolios as well. So, just for the record, Cabinet Secretary, you will understand, do the interim targets as set out in the Bill fulfil the IPCC's requirement for rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society? As far it, as you're concerned, they do? Yes, absolutely they do. The IPCC May, may I? Yes. The IPCC report said that the world needs to reach peak emissions very soon. Scotland has passed peak emissions. Um, you know, we've, we've halved emissions since 1990. We've got the most ambitious targets for 2020 and 2030. So I think that very much delivers what the IPCC said. Thanks very much. Mike Ruskell. I wonder, though, if there are assumptions here which could still be challenged. I mean, the assumption, for example, in the UK CCC advice that in 2050 we'll still be producing electricity by burning North Sea gas. Is that, is that, that feels like a very early 20th century debate. Surely technology will have moved on by then. Uh, it may have. Um, I know oil and gas production is changing rapidly um, and uh, I, you know, I can't foresee at that point, what the you know what might be uh, the case, and I, I suppose the Committee for Climate Change isn't, in that sense, in any better position than us than being able to anticipate uh, 32 years from now uh, what technologies would be available um, and applicable either to that industry or to any other industry, and 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 that you know is is the difficulty for all of this that we're we're you know we could be unbeknownst to us, on the brink of some major technological changes in some areas, or we may not. Um, and we have to proceed on the basis of what we know now, as opposed to what we think might be the case in another 20 or 30 years. Very short supplementary. Right, uh, thank you, Medina. Um, 
Cabinet Secretary, some people would argue, and can you not see that it, it is a credible argument, you've talked about credible and realistic, to say that um, the climate change plans as we continue are the, mechan the policy mechanisms by which, uh, on the back of innovation and technology that develops in, over the next 30, 40 years, that that is the way in which we can be even more ambitious than, than the net zero that... Um, well, than 90% than that you uh, think we should be on now. Right. Uh, well, surely that, that's the Well, yes, there. the climate there change plans. Yes, there, well, yeah, but the climate change plans on, you know, we don't legislate the plan. The plan no. is an official document that is a constantly changing um, discussion that government has to have with stakeholders and with the committee uh, to develop. And, and I've already indicated that the minute this piece of legislation is through, we will be looking at the current climate change plan. And I need to remind you, it's not long signed off on that the I current climate change remind. plan, <laughs> that the current climate change plan, we will have to look at it again um, because it will have to be, you know, updated. And I would expect the committee as, 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 as much as they may feel <laughs> that that is just a constantly kind of constant cycle of thinking but in truth that's what it is and, and yes precisely and that is where these discussions and 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 detailed conversations uh, need to be had the question is from finley carson thank you uh, section five sets out this the target setting criteria and and generally people have uh, welcomed the the addition uh, an update from the 2009 act however some of the evidence we we heard suggested that uh, one of the target setting criteria, which is not exceeding the fair and safe Scottish emissions budget, uh, the, the terms fair and safe should be defined and calculated. Could I have your, your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think... Uh, um, sorry, where is it? There it is. Sorry, I just... I'm going backwards and forwards in the, in the folder. Um, well, basically, the term fair and safe pretty much means the total amount of emissions over the period which the Committee for Climate Change think would be consistent with an appropriate Scottish contribution um, to global efforts. So basically, that's all fair and safe means. Now, I, I, I think that probably to a lot of people sounds just a little bit circular and doesn't really kind of say very much. but. So I think that there is an issue around the potential tweaking of that definition if people are particularly interested in that, to make fair and safe expand beyond simply that or be a bit more specific than that. And I think that's a conversation that could be had um, reasonably um, with everybody and the committee. Yeah, certainly the, 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 there was a desire that it was def defined and, and, uh, and calculated. There was also um, a suggestion that uh, public health should be one of the, the, the target setting criteria. Um, do you believe that public health should be added, given that it, it could relate to preventative health spend and fuel poverty? Um, I mean, I think that's a discussion we can have if we're going to add that into fair and safe, but there is a danger then we start to expand that out to, to cover so many things that it becomes becomes meaningless as well. If, if, if because, because if you recall the earlier part of the evidence that I was giving. There's quite a lot of work being done in other parts of, 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 of government that are already dealing with uh, some of those aspects. Uh, and to a certain extent, the Just Transition Commission is about the fair part, if you like, um, which we are taking forward as well. So I think there are, I mean, there, there is a discussion to be had about it, and I'm happy to have that conversation. Yeah. Mark Ruskell. Do you find achievable in relation to a net zero target? Well, um, achievable effectively means being able to show how we get from here to there in that way that is both credible and realistic. And that means avoiding rhetorical flourishes, but actually looking at what can be done and over what timescale it can be done. So achievability, uh, I think, has to be uh, quite specific in that sense, that it isn't simply about... Um, uh, it isn't simply about uh, 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 setting a target without actually thinking about how you get there. Um, so uh, achievability, um, uh, if, if we set a target that isn't credible, uh, if, if people are going to respond by saying, what's the point in even trying, 
then frankly that means it's not achievable. Um, and uh, what will happen then is in the future, governments will simply shrug their shoulders and say they can't be blamed for not meeting them because they weren't achievable. Um, I, I think Lord Debon uh, um, indicated to the committee that in his view there was a degree of judgment around this. Um, uh, if it's financially possible, if there's a technological uh, pointer, if they can put together um, a, a, a way of getting there, um, that doesn't require effectively a leap in the dark, then that's an achievable pathway. That's all we're looking for. We're looking for, uh, uh, you can't get absolute certainty on this, but we're looking for something that we can actually, in practical terms, go to people and say, this is how we get from here to there. This is what we need to do. This is where we need to be thinking um, and present that to them, and that's the achievability issue. So let's say we set a very ambitious target you know, far north of what's currently in the bill. Uh, and we came very close to, to achieving it, but we didn't achieve it. W would there be any advantages to society as a result of that, of that pathway to trying to meet a target? Would we have sent out any positive signals to business, to innovators? I would still need to know what you were talking about in terms of getting there, uh, um, because it is at the present time, we don't have a pathway uh, uh, I mean, I remind everybody that the Committee for Climate Change's advice was that 90% was at the very limits of feasibility. Now, I would hope, very much hope, um, that nobody here thought that a government should act in a way that was not feasible. Um, so we are asking the Climate Change Committee to, to update its advice two years down the line to consider whether they think there is now a feasible way of doing it. And if there is a feasible way of doing it, we will do it that way. But do you see any feedback in terms of innovation? So by setting a net zero target, you then set out a, a signal for those that want but to But innovation is to, happening to right in. now and, and, and happening across the board right now. And we're sitting at the moment at 80% target. So, you know, the innovation is happening. I'm not sure... Uh, uh, that uh, a, an argument uh, about this particular target is necessarily going to drive innovation any faster than it's already been driven. So why was achievability not a major factor in the 2009 bill then? But it is in this bill. Pretty sure it was in the discussions at the time. <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, the, the reality is in the 2009 bill, there was a lot of discussion about targets as well. Um, and I, I seem to remember, and I may be wrong because I wasn't, doing the 2009 bill, uh, but uh, I seem to remember there being a choice of two targets at the time as well, um, not sure, and that we did go for the, for the higher target. Yeah, for the higher one. Yeah. The, so, the you term know. achievability is in the 2009 Act. It is, okay, there you go. So achievability has been, it, but you know, at the end of the day, achievability ought not to have to be in legislation, because are we seriously arguing that a government and a parliament should actually be legislating on things that it currently doesn't think are achievable? I, I think that would be an astonishing kind of position to be in. So achievability ought to underpin just about everything we do without having to be legislated for. Now, achievability was a discussion in terms of the 2009 legislation, is a discussion now, but it's, it's a discussion driven by the advice that we've had uh, it, that effectively, at the moment, the advice we've got says that, that it's not because they can't see a pathway to it. And that's, that's why we're having this discussion in the terms we are. But effectively, every piece of government legislation, every government policy has to be predicated on achievability. Otherwise, what, 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 I mean, it's not a game. So, so it's physically impossible to meet net zero target? No, no, I'm sorry. You can go on twisting my words if you want. You know perfectly well that is not what I'm saying. At this point, because a couple of the people that we've heard from, Lord Devon as well, and I believe Andy Kerr from Climate Exchange, warned against or were critical of other governments who have been virtue signalling. What is the negative impact? If you, if you do that, if you, if you do put something out there that is saying, we're going to do X, but as you say, you're not looking behind it about what's actually achievable there. What is, what's the, the, the impact that could have? Well, I mean, I can't speak for everybody's targets and policy statements and, and, and things. All I can keep saying is that a lot of governments make 
these high-level calls, but they're not legislating for them, they're not being held to account for them, and in many cases, they're certainly not being held to account in the next 10, 15, and 20 years, and a lot of the expectation is loaded into a presumption that somewhere around about 2035, 2040, we're going to have this amazing technological changes that will make all of this doable. Well, the difficulty is, I think, in those circumstances, if that doesn't come through, then the danger is people, ordinary people and businesses, etc., will default to the, well, what is the point of this if it's not actually achievable? And I would rather set out on the way we're doing it to talk in terms of achievability, talk in terms of credibility, talk in terms about realistic expectations and to only push further when we know that all of those things are locked into place. And, you know, the UK Committee for Climate Change comes back with advice in whatever, March, April, May, whenever they come back with advice, and they tell us, yes, it is now feasible, then we will do it. So it's really, you know, I mean, we may be talking about the difference between, you know, where we currently are in terms of the legislation at the moment and where the government might choose to amend it in just a few months' time. I mean, I, 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 you know, we are in danger of angels dancing on the head of a pin here. Mm. Stuart Stevenson. Um, is achievability also about avoiding things that won't contribute to achievability? Um, and I, I go back to the Northern Ireland Renewable Heat Initiative, which has actually made things worse in climate change and has cost half a billion pounds. Um, so that in looking at things and concluding whether they're achievable or not, we also have to look at the risks, if they are serious, that they are not achievable, both in wasting money, but also in taking us in the wrong direction. Well, indeed, and we've had conversations already uh, this morning uh, around that. Um, I, I think to a certain extent, uh, what you have to be able to do is to uh, make the best decision that you can make with the evidence that you have. Um, uh, uh, you know, we can foresee the unforeseeable. Um, I don't know whether or not the Renewable Heat Initiative in Northern Ireland was something that they were specifically targeting towards climate change uh, emissions reductions. I guess they thought that would be a good benefit from it, but it is precisely the example of what can happen if something goes very badly wrong. On the other hand, you know, we have to avoid paralysis uh, uh, as well. So, you know, there will continually be a balance of advantage and disadvantage that we have to be making a decision about, um, uh, but we have, to, we have to go forward on this. There's, there's absolutely no doubt about that. We have to go forward. So we, 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 we have to avoid the danger of paralysis uh, in, in some areas, uh, which we, we could end up in if all we are constantly doing is balancing looking at risks. There will be risks in almost everything we do. Everything we do in life carries a risk. Um, it's about best evidence. It's about realism. It's about credibility. It's about making decisions uh, uh, which can be absolutely justified. And if there are disadvantages, that they can be worked off against the advantages and, and balanced in that way. Questions from Angus MacDonald. Thanks, um, Convener. If I can go back to uh, the issue of the, the use of carbon credits, which, which we touched on uh, earlier. Under what circumstances might carbon credits be used, for example, um, to, ch to achieve uh, net zero? Uh, and given that their availability and cost is likely to be prohibitive uh, from the 2040s onwards, why is the ability to use them being retained? Well, I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine that, that credits will ever be used. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the current bill um, effectively establishes a new default position so that we can't use credits to help meet uh, a target. But if in the future um, there is a, a thought that it, that it should be, uh, allowed, then we would effectively have to go back to Parliament. It would have to go through an entire process in order for that to happen. Um, so we're not really uh, expecting that uh, uh, to be uh, to be the case. I mean, effectively, credits can't be used to meet. But in this bill, credits cannot be used to meet targets at all unless we bring forward an affirmative SI um, in order uh, to do so. Um, and 
even in a non-zero limit, then it can never represent more than 20% of the year-on-year -year change in emissions. But the cost of it, just effectively, from Scotland's perspective, rules this out. I mean, I, I don't, you know, we, we have a, you know, we, if we were using uh, uh, credits to make up the gap, particularly uh, with a net zero target that we're not currently got a pathway to, then we're talking about around 15 billion over the period of 2050. And I don't think our budget, our Scottish budget, would could possibly support that because it would have to be found from right across the Scottish Government. And I don't see what the point is because effectively that is back to the decision about offshoring because you're effectively just letting somebody else do the emissions on your behalf. And you're banking, you're banking the, 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 the good feeling that you've achieved your targets, but you haven't done anything for global emissions reductions at all. So I think carbon credits are a bit of a, bit of a red herring in all of this. Okay, well, just continuing on the, the, the red herring theme, um, the, the, um, you, you mentioned the 20 percent, you mentioned the 20 percent limit, um, so we're, we're just curious how that was decided upon and, and what analysis was done to arrive at that figure. Uh, you would need to ask the Labour Party, it was their amendment in 2009 <laughs> legislation, okay. so um, I'm not sure what the thinking at the time was, and okay. in fairness, I don't think Claudia was here either, well, no. I don't know what the thinking was. I suspect it will have been, we, we will have accepted the amendment in a spirit of, of, of trying to give something to, okay. you know. Okay. But we, there, wasn't, there wasn't detailed government. And, and, you know, there was a determination not to be using them. So I, I suppose we felt that accepting the amendment at the time was not something that was, a, was an issue. Okay. Um, with regard to inventory uh, revisions, um, we, we've, we've heard that uh, uh, a response from the bill team a, a while back um, that a fundamental change in the scope mm. of future inventories is expected due to the incorporation of new emissions factors and categories of peatland condition, which is likely to substantially increase emissions from Lulu CF in Scotland. Um, so uh, just on that point, will inventory revisions make targets easier or harder to meet? And, you know, for example, by how much will the inclusion of peatland emissions increase emissions from the Lulu CF sector and what work's been done to mitigate these? Well, the thing with inventory revisions is they're completely out of our control because they are, they are driven by changes in science effectively and uh, changes in measurement. So uh, uh, they, can, uh, uh, they can help in one year and hinder in another year um, and they're quite volatile. Um, which is one of the reasons why quite a lot of countries don't include, include Lulu CF uh, in, their, uh, in their emission stats um, because of that volatility. Um, so the decision was made uh, in Scotland to include them, uh, but that does mean that then we are subject to that volatility, which can be year on year. Now, we know that there are some very major uh, uh, revisions coming down the track. We haven't seen them in detail yet. The, I understand the UK government has the report, but it's not sharing it with us, so we haven't seen the detail yet. Um, uh, uh, but we know it's going to be pretty significant. And as I understand it, um, uh, then, I mean, they're very much a particular issue for us because we have the annual targets. So here we are again, you know, year on year, this can have an impact. Uh, and we're not proposing to change annual targets for that reason, but we do have to have a way of managing these inventory revisions. There was a period about 18 months ago when we thought this bill would be, end up being subsumed by this argument about inventory revisions, but the work that we've done with stakeholders and everybody behind the scenes to, to bottom out the impacts on this means that we've come to what we consider to be uh, a, a reasonable conclusion. Um, in terms of the amount that we're talking of, as I said, um, uh, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, and we haven't seen the detail of the report. Um, but Scotland has about two-thirds of the UK peatland, um, uh, uh, but only accounts for about a third of emissions from peatland. So the, we think the impact in Scotland could be around six megatons of CO2, uh, about 10% of the inventory, and that, well, that would increase emissions by four to five percentage points. So you can see that the... The, the impact is quite significant um, if we don't technically manage it in a better way. Um, and, and it needs to be remembered that this is nothing to do with domestic effort. The, this, the, the inventory revisions are changes in measurements, 
changes in uh, science, changes in understanding, and will continue to be the case, particularly in this sector. Um, I mean, there, there was a year, I think, where we benefited from in inventory revisions in, in terms of forestry because they found a way of counting uh, smaller parts of woodland cover than, than had originally been taken into the, uh, in, into the, into the stats. Um, uh, so that was a measurement change as opposed to a, uh, um, as opposed to a, a science change, although I suppose measurement is science as well. So, you know, and, and that all happens at a, a level way above us. Mark, and then um, just further to that, I'm just wondering if there are if there's work happening to look at the way that we measure the emissions coming from agriculture, because there's obviously the emissions that come from agricultural production, but there's also all the other things that agricultural holdings do, including renewable energy production, agroforestry, all of that. And does that perhaps start to address some of the issues we were talking about earlier in terms of? The difficulties agriculture has in terms of meeting zero emissions. But. I think it's fair to say that's a bit of a, <laughs> a, a, a bit of a grumble amongst the agricultural sector that mm. they don't get the credit for a, a lot of the things that they are doing uh, because those those achievements are assigned to different different sectors. So uh, um, uh, you know, in a sense, we need to recognise that farmers, particularly, are doing a lot more than it looks like they're doing uh, in this in this regard. Um, uh, I, I think there is work uh, uh, ongoing where we are uh, uh, looking at the potential for reducing emissions in agriculture with both the industry and the scientific community, um, and we are uh, uh, um, talking to them about how, how we might better uh, reflect their, their achievements. Um, I don't know if there's a particular... If there's, particular things that you want. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's a conversation um, uh, 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 around what we can better do in terms of, if we go back to the food production uh, side, uh, uh, to be had. Um, but there is a question over how do you assign emissions reductions sector by sector. Mm. Yeah, it, exactly. It's very difficult to look at the inventory and sort of allocate who is responsible for, you know, which which emission reduction in which sector. I think one of the, um, an er error that people quite commonly and very understandably make is thinking that the agriculture sector in the statistics reflects everything that farmers do. But there's a big difference between everything that farmers do and agriculture, and they do an awful lot to reduce emissions that gets captured in the other um, sectors such as power generation um, and that is all captured in the inventory it's just not under the agriculture heading yeah. so I think there's maybe something that we need to do when we're talking about the statistics to make very clear that um, agriculture doesn't equal everything that farmers and landowners are doing I mean remember that when we the, the greenhouse gas emissions come I mean this, this is a kind of international set standard so mm -hmm. So what we count for agriculture is is part of that. Um, uh, I, I think there's a I think there is perhaps an opportunity for us to, uh, even though it's not part of the greenhouse gas stats every year, to nevertheless uh, try and do a calculation that that shows what agriculture is delivering, on the understanding that that means that you're, you you can't use that as a replacement for what appears in the greenhouse gas emission stats, because that's that's measuring a very specific thing as so, opposed to the wider but but it's not just agriculture that's affected like that as well I mean the the issue about buildings is also um, uh, affected in a similar way in that you know some of the work that's done will be assigned to you know the energy sector as opposed to um, the building so that you know it's not it's not just as uh, as straightforward uh, as that in any of the sectors Carson. Um, we, we just touched on the the uh, how peat and agriculture, whatever, uh, I've, I've got an important part to play. But I, I would like to just get on record. Uh, we know that uh, climate change is not, it doesn't have any national boundaries or whatever. So on a UK scale, can you, can you put on record how you're engaging with the, the UK government to take forward uh, the whole of the UK making advancements? What what's discussions are you having currently? Um, I try to engage as much as is possible, but sometimes it's a little one-sided. 
Right, we're going to move on to questions from John Scott. Oh, thank you, convener and um, cabinet secretary. These are a series of questions around times in the financial memorandum, 13 billion cost estimate. <laughs> Crucial. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the actuality bit. Um, emission pathways in non-energy sectors, including land use change, waste and parts of agriculture, were not updated in moving from 80% to 90% in the Times modelling. Why were these not updated? Uh, I, I think the short answer would be that, that we considered them to already be pretty much uh, um, uh, you know, at the point where we couldn't see a pathway beyond that. Now, that doesn't mean to say that isn't going to change in the future, but that the, the we feel at present to actually um, uh, update them further would be us basically out in a canoe without paddles and in those circumstances it doesn't when it comes to doing these times runs doesn't make sense i don't know if simon wants to expand on my very non-scientific answer um absolutely yes so i think what we're trying to do in the times framework and the associated model which goes on alongside that is look at the least cost option for moving from 80 percent to 90 percent so when we were doing that what that very much identified was that whilst our options in all sectors for increasing emission reductions, the most cost-effective way, cost-effective way that we could identify would be focusing primarily on industry, on surface transport, and to an extent on buildings and property as well. And so that's why the modelling and what fed into the national memorandum was on that basis. I see. Um, so in terms of the confidence in the estimated figure of 13 billion pounds, we have a, a variety of figures in front of us, which, to be frank, I don't fully understand, um, where the, the cost for achieving 90% is said to be £13 billion. Um, unadjusted for inflation, however, the cost goes up to £25 billion. And then adjusting for inflation, but removing the impact of discounting the estimated cost of moving to a 90% target is £59 billion. Pounds. Now, which figure do we use? I appreciate we're being given, I appreciate what the Cabinet Secretary is saying that we're trying to, or, or Mr Fuller is saying that we're trying to achieve the least cost way of getting to where we want to be, a, a position I would utterly subscribe to. But um, these are, there's a huge range there of figures and, what, and I just would welcome an explanation of, of how these figures actually work, what they mean, given that they're out there and how we, we got to them. Please. Simon, thank you. Absolutely. OK, so starting kind of the highest figure and working back might be the easiest way to do this. So the 59 billion figure, in effect, would be the cash outlay, so the amount of money which would have to go out the door. The reason then we have figures which are adjusted for inflation and discounting is because these cash outlays will occur over a 32-year period. And clearly, when you spend a billion pound in 2050, the real cost of that is less than a billion pound in today's prices because you have inflation, you have economic growth over that period, and more generally, you know, spending money in the future is easier than it is spending money today. So then what we have is the 25 billion number, which takes into account the discounting, which would be in effect the um, taking factor in future economic growth, which obviously affects the affordability of policies. The idea of doing discounting is very much standard practice when looking at costs over a longer time frame, <coughs> and the discount rates and assumptions we use are taken from Treasury's Greenbrook appraisal guidance, which basically sets out standard assumptions which should be used when discounting over future years. So that gets you to your 25 billion number. And then the final adjustment we make is inflation over a 32-year period is quite substantial. So we want to strip out the effect of inflation. So then what we get is a figure which provides the most realistic expression of what the cost could be when thinking about it in today's prices. <laughs> um, I wouldn't go so far as to call that sophistry, but it... But it does sound a wonderful way of dressing up the fact that this is actually going to cost £59 billion, but at today's prices, it's only £13 billion. 
Can I just say, sophistry is a little unfair when, well, we're, when we're actually applying what is a standard okay. practice okay. that all governments will use yes. in the UK. I mean, we're not, we're not departing from what is considered to be the appropriate way of, of trying to calculate this. And, and yes, to a degree, th there's got to be a built-in uncertainty because we, mm -hmm. we can't know for certain. But what we're trying to do is, is use all of the... Uh, the, the tools that we have and that are understood to be as robust, and these are treasury kind of ways of calculating it. So if you're going to call it sophistry, then effectively you're calling your own... Okay. I submit, I submit. <laughs> <laughs> I give in, Kermit. You know, all we're doing it, is what is considered to be established practice. But, you know, it's, it's, so I, I, I think I agree that there's a degree of... of uh -huh. I mean, it, it's a sophisticated guesswork, but it is guesswork. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll go back to the questions. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, so we should have then absolute confidence, well, or as much as we can, with all the caveats the Cabinet Secretary just said, in this £13 billion figure. I mean, the, the variability in the, in the Times model, from what I have read about there being 2,000 variables, and then each of those variables has four different variables, which takes you up to about 8,000 variables. I, I, in terms of in terms of probability theory, I don't know how all of that holds together in terms of very sophisticated mathematics it must be to have absolute confidence in those predictions with so many variables in there. But um, do you want to further... I don't think anybody can have absolute confidence. Absolute, you know, uh, uh, isn't a word I would use here. I think we can have reasonable confidence on the basis of the... Uh, of, of what we're doing and saying now, that these figures, to the best of our knowledge, are appropriate. Um, now, you know, in 20, 30, 40 years' time, might people be here sitting laughing um, about that? I, ca I can't say that for sure. Uh, uh, but, you know, all of this has to be done on the basis of our best understanding right now and uh, using the appropriate methods that are mandated for use across the whole of the UK in order to achieve the results we've achieved. And that is really, folks, the very best I can say. OK, I think that... Oh, gosh, there's more. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, does the £13 billion pound include consideration of the potential social, economic and environmental benefits of climate mitigation policies for example, health benefits or benefits to biodiversity? No, as I understand it, no, that's, that's, we haven't tried to do that side of the equation, but we do make the point, uh, and I have made the point, um, uh, that there will be um, uh, other benefits, um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, they might not all be easily quantifiable. Uh, but they do exist. And there is also an economic benefit. I mean, you know, Mark Ruskell was asking questions earlier about this. this there clearly is an economic benefit uh, in terms of the technological change and innovation uh, that, that is happening right now and will continue to happen uh, in, in respect of this. I think the last time we looked at it, it was something like $29 trillion. Well, is it is available globally? Is available globally. Yeah, yeah but I, I, you know, I mean, not yes. There'd be a bit much to be expecting that to be available in Scotland, but um, <laughs> I think but, so. but globally. So there, are, there, there, there is. But of course, that isn't any more quantifiable. I mean, I don't know what the calculation is that has produced that figure. But there is a figure, and there are people thinking about the potential benefits that there are as well. Um, uh, uh, you know, what what we have to produce here is the potential costs, and we have done it in the best possible way we can. Have you done any analysis uh, on the risks and cost benefits of actions to mitigate climate change at different rates from the ones you're proposing? Well, yep. we, in arriving at the proposal for a 90% target, we um, conducted a range of impact assessments on the difference between a, the current target, 80% and 90%. I won't list them. There are um, a, a good handful. And that set out various cost benefits and risks. And then in the difference between a 90% target and a net zero target, we set out as best we could what we thought the risks and um, different ways we might achieve that could be in the analysis paper that was published alongside the bill. And the main, um, just very, very briefly summarise the primary 
benefits of impact um, of tackling climate change as quickly as we feasibly can are around um, being at the forefront of the global shift to carbon neutrality um, and getting a, a good share of the, the figure that the cabinet secretary mentioned as all countries move to carbon neutrality there's going to be um, good markets for those technologies and skills so um, Scotland being at the forefront can capitalize on that very successfully there's also all the co-benefits of um, clean air and more active travel and those those kind of health benefits the risks are around um, the interactions with um, other policies and the social risks. So there's there are risks to fuel poverty if we try and go too far too fast. The interaction between reducing emissions and reducing fuel poverty is very, very finely balanced. There's a very finely tuned equation there. If we try and do one sort of too fast, then we will damage the other one. Um, so that was one of the major risks that we looked at. Could you explain that just a little bit more? Because this was um, said by Minister Paul Wheelhouse in his statement last week, and and I didn't fully understand what the assists, what the risks were of moving forward more quickly on those target targets of reducing um, heat losses. Sure. So um, in terms of increasing energy efficiency of a building, um, that that's not an issue in terms of impact on um, greenhouse gas emissions. There, there are different kind of risks there relating to um, whether or not Scotland can get the economic benefits from the supply chain, um, which I'm much less familiar with. Um, in terms of moving to lower carbon fuels to heat homes, quite currently, um, and I'm gonna oversimplify this, um, Currently, fossil fuel heating is cheaper than um, mm -hmm. low carbon heating. So if we push really fast to reduce emissions, then we'll push people to use more expensive fuels, which will increase fuel poverty. And vice versa is also true. If we push quite hard to reduce fuel poverty, more people will use more fuel, fossil fuel heating and will increase emissions. So there's a very fine balance there and we have to try and achieve both through a carefully calibrated, steady approach. So, so if I've understood you, it's because you're expecting the cost of um, fuel that's produced with less carbon emissions, the cost of that type of energy to come down, then that's why we are prepared to wait a little longer to get to that point before pushing for these improvements. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I just want to thank the Cabinet Secretary and our officials for all their evidence this morning. I'm going to suspend this meeting for a short period to allow us change over and allow the Cabinet Secretary and our officials to leave. Thank you.
Okay. Right, the third item on our agenda today is to consider a number of requests from the Scottish Government to the Committee to consent to the UK Government legislation using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to a number of UK statutory instruments. The first of these is the Health and Safety Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is 28th of November. That's tomorrow. Have we any comments on that? This no. SI. No. Okay, so is the committee content for Scottish Government to give its consent to UK ministers from UK ministers to lay the Health and Safety Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2018 in the UK Parliament? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we will write to the government to let them know that uh, the committee content to delegate authority to me to sign off that letter. Yeah. Thank you. The second instrument is the Environment Miscellaneous Amendments EU Exit Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament the 2nd of December. Do we have any comments on this? No. Uh, thanks, Kavina. I've got a, a brief comment, um, perhaps more about how the government, Scottish Government keeps pace with European legislation um, post-Brexit and the event of Brexit. Um, I know that, that it's mentioned in here about the provisions of the um, European Environment Action Plan, and that covers a number of areas from biodiversity, air quality, climate change, circular economy. Um, and clearly, you know, there's an issue in, in relation um, to this SI around how the government uses the provisions that are in the Withdrawal Bill or the Continuity Bill, whichever one um, we're operating under in terms of how we keep pace with um, that action plan. So it's slightly separate to the, the detailed nature of the regulations that are before us, but it is, it is an issue that, that, is, um, that is related to it. So I think getting some clarity of the Scottish Government about how they're working, intend to work with the Europe, European Environment Action Plan post-Brexit and so it's more what of a work streams they have. Around I, these it, it, it's, a, it's an issue convenient that, that I think arises from um, this regulation in, in, in relation to how we keep pace going forward and what the Scottish Government's action plans might be um, to ensure that regulatory alignment, which is something that the Government has committed to. Obviously, given that the deadline is the 2nd of December, we won't have time to get that response back, but we can include your, your points in the letter if you're content for, for that letter. Uh, if that's the most appropriate way to, yeah. to do that, if that's a letter back to the Scottish Government, then yeah. I would appreciate that convener. But we obviously won't be able to get a response before this, this deadline. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any other comments? Is the committee consent, uh, content for the Scottish Government to give its consent for UK ministers to lay the Environment Miscellaneous Amendments EU Exit Regulations 2018 in the UK Parliament? Consent. And will write to the Scottish Government, obviously taking Mark Ruskell's points into consideration. Are you content to delegate authority to me to sign off this letter? Yes. Thank you. The third instrument is the Floods and Water Amendments, etc. EU Exit Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 2nd of December again. Do we have any comments? No. Nope. Is the committee content for the Scottish Government to give its consent for UK ministers to lay the floods and water amendments, etc.? EU, thank you. And we'll write to the Scottish Government, are you all content to delegate authority for me to sign off that letter? Thank you. The fourth instrument is the justification of practices for ionising radiation, radioactive contaminated land, England, Northern Ireland and nuclear reactors, environmental impact assessment for decommissioning, miscellaneous amendments, EU exit regulations. 2018, members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 6th of December. Do we have any comments on any of that? Yes. And it was in relation to, uh, again, post-Brexit, post-withdrawal post uh, environmental governance uh, around this area. So obviously there, are, there is testing, there are standards, um, but the question is around who polices uh, the government in, in that case. And um, I believe in some of the briefing material that, that we've had, that there is still some uncertainty around how the post-Brexit environmental governance arrangements will relate to this particular area.
Um, I know it's something that we've raised before in, in committee, and I'm just wondering, again, if there's an opportunity to seek clarification, if there's any more uh, certainty coming from discussions between Scottish Government and, and Westminster around uh, what that overall governance uh, of this area will, will look like um, post 29th of March. Yeah, I mean, Clarence have just given me the advice, of course, that we do have uh, cabinet secretaries in front of us. We can ask that question of them, actually, to them in in public session. However, we can also include that in, in the letter as well. But I think yeah, that, that's an issue that we have raised before, and I think that we're about to get an update on how the two governments are, are, are coordinating things and working together, so we can uh, add that question to what we ask them next week. The briefing yes. question, um, convener, that was around uh, again the briefing material we've had around um, this regulation uh, talks about the nuclear cooperation agreements that exist uh, between different states, and again it'd be useful to get some clarity uh, over what cooperation agreements that we have, and in particular if we have any cooper cooperation agreements with Australia in relation to the disposal and treatment of civil nuclear waste. Okay, happy for everyone, happy for that to go in a letter as well. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so is the committee content for the Scottish Government to give its consent for UK ministers to lay the justification of practice for ionising radiation, radioactive contaminated land, England, Northern Ireland, and nuclear reactors, environmental impact assessment for decommissioning, EU exit regulations 2018 in the UK Parliament? Are we content? And we'll write to the Scottish Government. And are you happy to delegate authority to me to sign off that letter? Yes. Thank you. The final instrument is the Leg Hold Traps Amendment, EU Exit Regulations 2018. Members will note the deadline for consent from the Scottish Parliament is the 10th of December. Do we have any comments on this? <coughs> no. Excuse me. Bless you. Okay. Is the committee consent for the Scottish Government to give its consent to UK ministers to lay the leg hold traps amendment EU exit regulations 2018 in the UK Parliament? Consent. Thank you. We'll write to the Scottish Government. Is uh, everyone content for me to have the authority to sign off that letter? Consent. Thank you. Okay. Right, agenda item three, subordinate legislation. Uh, on the Environmental Noise Scotland Amendment Regulations. So the, this is the fourth item on my agenda this morning, to consider the Environmental Noise Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 SSI, uh, 2018 oblique 342. Do we have any comments on this? No? Yes? Went convener. It was, um, I was wanting to seek clarity about um, how this relates to the assessment of uh, aviation flight path changes um, and the uh, the consultative and regulatory approach to um, to dealing with that um, I mean obviously we don't you know we don't have officials with us so um, I'm not sure the best way to, to seek a clarification on that particular matter although Stuart Stevenson probably has the answer and he's got his pen up I mean the, we will have to send a letter with those concerns in it um, Stuart well, it, it is laid out in Annex A under policy objectives, um, where it says, where it discusses the maps, uh, estimate people's exposure to noise from road, rail, and specifically aviation. So it clearly does address that issue. And of course, it does merely replace the existing uh, uh, secondary legislation um, that came in in 2006, which did the same. So in, in that sense, this covers aviation as the previous one did. Yes. I find my point then. So um, I accept that it does cover aviation. Um, my, my question then is about how this then relates to the processes established by the Civil Aviation Authority in terms of uh, assessing changes in, in flight paths and whether this um, SI then influences that directly, whether that makes any substantive changes to the way that um, the, the, those current processes are, are undertaken. It's a particularly <coughs> live issue at the moment in relation to Edinburgh Airport and the, and the standards of assessment and consultation that um, Edinburgh Airport is having to go through under the auspices of the CAA 
in order to provide information about noise and to consult on that with communities. So my question is about whether this has a consequence of that in terms of influencing that in some way in terms of the way that noise is, is, uh, is dealt with under that current regime. Okay. Well, we, we will write to, to the government on that and I'll allow, you know, we, we'll, we'll put the letter so that you are clear that the content of the letter reflects the comments that you've made today. Okay. Right. So, uh, are we agreed that, that we don't want to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument and just um, put Mark Ruskell's comments on the letter to the government to get clarity there? Yes, yeah. yeah, thank you. The committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery will now be vacated. Following agenda item 5, the committee will suspend and reconvene at 2.30pm in public to hear evidence from the Scottish Government of officials on a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to the storage of carbon dioxide regulations 2018. Now suspend this meeting. Thank you.